Welcome to episode 11 of the Norton Nemesis 1500cc V8 rebuild. And in this episode, I'm going to be fitting the pistons and assembling the V8 engine block onto the gearbox and clutch. When I had the cylinder liners made for the V8 engine, I had the bores done one thousandth of an inch smaller than standard size. This is because I'm going to be reusing the old pistons and this would retain the original bore clearance. The pistons have only one compression ring, so I remove it to check for end gap clearance in the cylinder liner. I also check the surface for any deep scores or scratches, but these are absolutely amazingly clean and nice and shiny, so that's really good. I carefully slide the piston ring into the, into the cylinder liner. It's quite a tight fit and the gap closes up nicely. When I measure it my feeler gauge, it's around about 10 thou, which is acceptable. I now repeat this for the remaining seven compression rings and they're all just exactly the same. The connecting rods are biased one side to the other side, so I need to check which way they fit into the engine so they're in the centre of the bore. I can then fit the pistons onto the connecting rod, making sure they're around the right way. Because these pistons are biased front to back with the exhaust valve and the inlet valve and quick pockets with the machine in the top, so they need to be around the correct way. And there's a little arrow that points to exhaust. And here you can see the side of the con rod is slightly offset left to right. With the gudgeon pin nicely inserted, I fit the wire clip to hold it in place. These wire clips are very stiff to insert and take a bit of time to get in, but they go in eventually and they snap in nice and tight, which is a good thing. So I'm now ready to install the piston and the connection rod into the engine. So the first thing I do is remove the two bolts holding the cap on the bottom of the connection rod and remove the end cap. Before I slide the piston into the bore, I put a bit of oil to make sure it slides in nicely. And also we put a bit of oil on the big end shell as well to make sure it rotates freely on the crankshaft. I slide the piston into the cylinder liner until it hits the bottom of the oil rings and I can pummel, pummel them in gently with my fingers and a small screwdriver until the piston slides in freely. I look out the door and the blackbird comes right up to the door to get mealworms that I've thrown to him. He's so tame. With the blackbird fed, I can now tip the engine over onto its side to get to the crankshaft and engage the bottom of the connection rod. This is just a case of pushing the piston down by hand until it engages with the crankshaft nicely. The cap slides on nicely, engaging two dowel pins, and then I can replace the two bolts and tighten them. I do them up hand tight for now, because I'll be talking them down later on. I check the crankshaft moves freely and it does, and the piston goes up and down the bore. That's a good thing. I do this at every stage to check for binding and tightness. I now reposition the engine block so I can insert the next piston.
because I'm inserting these pistons by hand without a ring compressor, I found it easier to remove the compression ring and offer the piston up to the bore and engage the oil ring and then re-engage the, the compression ring afterwards. I found it much easier. I have got a, comp a piston ring compressor, but it just doesn't work properly on these pistons. With the cylinder bore and the big end shell fully lubricated, I insert the piston and connect the assembly into the bore, pushing it down carefully until it engages with the bottom of the piston. With the piston fully engaged, I now use a small blunt screwdriver to gently tease the oil ring into the groove a little bit at a time whilst maintaining downward pressure with my thumb till the piston slides in nicely. I can then refit the compression ring and engage that as well and push the piston down. It's a bit fiddly, but eventually it goes in and then the piston slides down nicely, so I'm really pleased with that. I pull the connecting rod down until it engages with the crank pin nicely. And then I can reinstall the end cap. With the second piston fitted, I check the free rotation of the crankshaft and it moves smoothly. So now it's just a case of repeating the process to fit the rest of the pistons. And here they are, all fitted nicely into the block. The next thing I need to do is turn the block over so I can torque up all the big ends. I set my torque wrench and start to do the big ends in sequence. With the accessible big ends tightened, I rotate the crankshaft to a new position so I can tighten the rest, noting that it turns freely as well, which is a good thing. And with the last bolt tightened, the crankshaft still moves freely, so that's just perfect. 
The next thing I need to do is clean the gasket surfaces with some brake cleaner prior to assembly to the gearbox and clutch assembly. This ensures the gasket sealer sticks nicely. With the upper crankcase assembly cleaned, I slide it across the bench to make room because I need to go and get the gearbox assembly from the shed. As I'm walking out into the garden, I notice a wagtail wagging his tail as he walks across the grass. And when I came back in the house, I noticed that Tracy is in the kitchen cooking, so we better go and see what she's up to today. As I walk in the kitchen, there's a different smell. It's not cupcakes, but I think it's gonna be mincemeat flapjack, which is really, really nice. She's already started mixing up some of the ingredients, but in goes a little bit of sugar. Not very much, we're cutting down on the sugar recently, we're putting about half the amount, which makes them even nicer. Then we add the mincemeat out of the jar. Mincemeat's normally associated with Christmas cooking, but we have it all year round. It's really nice. She uses the red spoon to mix up the mixture in the pan, then add some rolled oats. Just the right amount, just tipping it in. And you mix it up, it sort of resembles concrete when it's mixed up. It looks a bit lumpy, but it's really, really nice, I can assure you. And it's tipped into the tray, a bit like pouring concrete into foundations. And pat it down with a red spoon again, then it goes in the oven, cooked for half an hour. When it comes out, it's golden brown and smells amazing. So she then cuts it into nice portions. Not too big, just the right size. I try to take a bit, but it's far too hot to take, so I'm told to come back later when it's cooled. Back in the garage, I've got to clean up the gearbox assembly prior to mating it with a little engine block. So I go around with my brake cleaner and a bit of cloth to wipe all the gasket sealing surfaces until they're all clean and dry. Then the most important thing I must never forget to put in is the O-ring that seals the oil passageway. And then the two main bearing shells. I've got new main bearing shells from Suzuki, new old stock. They snap in just nicely. You line up the little tang, put a little bit of downward pressure and they snap in nice and tight. With the two shells fitted, I then put some assembly lubrication on the surfaces, spreading it out with my artist's brush. I now apply a thin bead of Permatex Ultra Grey Gasket Sealer to all the jointing surfaces, making sure not to miss the bolt holes and stud holes. I use my finger to smooth it out and make it nice and smooth. We're now ready for the exciting moment, lowering the V8 block down onto the gearbox assembly, lining up the stud holes and dowel pins until it rests nicely on the gasket joining, joining sealer. It pushes down nicely with the rubber mallets to make sure I can see that the gasket sealer is using out the joints, I'm getting a good connection, which is brilliant. So now I can put in the bolts holding it all together.
So check for clutch free movement on the crankshaft engagement. And there's just a nice little rattle, which is brilliant. And then I can put a bolt into the end of the crankshaft and see if I can turn that as well. And it turns freely backwards and forwards, which is really good. There are various size bolts that screw up from underneath the engine to hold it all together, starting with the two easy ones at the end and working my way inwards. Some of the bolts are very difficult to get to. I had to even cut down an Allen key to make it fit, but we got there in the end. I'm working on the engine with it in its upright position, sitting on its wooden framework that I made, because I don't want to really turn it over and rest it on the cylinder lines. It could disturb them now they're pressed in tightly into the block. Most of the screws are underneath, but there are a few on top. I did wonder to myself why these screws were coming in from the top down when they could have been gone up for the bottom up, but anyway, we'll get them in. This rear bolt here is actually a stud with a screwdriver slot and a nut, because there's a casting sticking out, so it's impossible to get a cap head bolt down inside there, but I guess it works. This row of cap air bolts at the front of the engine are really hard to get to. You can only just get the Allen key to engage and turn it an eighth of a turn at a time. It took for ages. But I got there in the end, and when it's done, it's done. With the last bolt tightened, I turn the crankshaft backwards and forwards and it turns really freely. The piston's got them down nicely, so I'm really pleased with that. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And in the next video, we'll be continuing with the bottom end build, fitting the alternator and making some new oil distribution pipes.